Have anyone any ideas why I lighted a candle? We're not going to all start praying now. <laughs> We're not, no. Um, I work with light, and that's kind of my medium for, for my creativity, I guess. And it stems from the way light behaves through glass, because I love the contraction of light in the glass. As you can see, most of my work is, is glass based. Um, now, loosely, you, you've got to get your light from somewhere. So, um, what I tend to do when I'm working with, with, uh, with light is create um, uh, arcs of electricity and that kind of thing. And, and the, that kind of light comes from um, plasma. And plasma is the fourth state of matter. So I've got to know an awful lot about science as well as art, um, which is why you see this mass array of paraphernalia in front of me here, because I want to try and tell you a little bit about the medium that I use, because it's not just the fact that I create with glass and bending it and, and putting electricity through it, it's about the way electricity behaves and, and the way the third state of matter behaves, as in plasma. So you've got, um, traditionally, from many, many years ago, you've got earth, you've water, air, and fire. So for many, many years, they've known about four states of matter, but it's only a very recent thing that it's become really more understood about what happens after something's a gas, when you make it hotter, when you put more energy through a gas, and that's when you get plasma. This is the most simple form of plasma you can get. It's called fire, a flame. So that's why I've lit a candle for you today, because you can see how easy it is to create plasma. So everybody can have a little bit of plasma in the home, just in the way of having a candle lit. So um, yeah, using plasma is just um, it's just great, because it does so many very, very, very things. You get so many colours from it, and it's such an exciting uh, medium to use. And you can cause it to do all sorts of crazy things. So if you force plasmas through restrictions and things, you can really detail what's going on. So you can see from this image here, which is a, a, a real close-up detail shot of one of the pieces that's upstairs. Um, and you can see how the plasma is being restricted, restricted and filtered out by the different contours of the glass. So I really invite you to study the glass. Don't just stand back and look at it. But look at it as though you're looking for brush strokes and a painting. Go up close and see the detail that's in there. Because this isn't easy to make either. So just like painting with a brush, you, you're looking for that you know, intrigue, that accuracy that you're trying to produce in your work. So when, you, when I'm, I'm talking about brushes and I'm talking about the way that we um, create images, well, I kind of use um, electricity to do these things. So, um, and to create a, a, enough electricity to make um, things up or go through a tube, then I need to use voltage. So what I do is I, I can use about 10,000 volts, so I can get this kind of thing happening. You know, air is really resistant to electricity. So you can see it doesn't jump very far. But you'll have seen from the work that I do, that particularly the, the dragon, the, the, the snake, it kind of is really long, so the arc is very long, it goes right through there. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to show you something which I personally find absolutely fascinating because of how I am up with this medium, but what can you do with two metal rods, a couple of bottles filled with sand, and some wire, any guesses? No? Sparks. You can create sparks, yes. But you can make things move, you can animate, you can really animate with it. So I've just got to get this sound about right. There we go. And then we connect this together. Let's put that one there. Now, not lots happening, but I can, I can play with electricity, so it's, it's really cool to actually be active with, these, with this stuff and you can generate an amazing vision just with a screwdriver, a couple of metal rods and, and it's just so beautiful. 
And of course, I wouldn't do it with my finger. If I put my finger in, it, it would have the same effect, but it would really hurt. So that's why I just stick out of and I can make it do it of its own accord, so here we go. It just buzzes through my finger a little bit because there's so much voltage. Or I can bring that together. And off we go. And it will keep doing that till the cows come home. And how beautiful is that? Has anybody got any idea why it goes up? Why it doesn't go down? There's two things at play here. You've got gravity which holds things down, but when you heat something up, it becomes lighter so it raises. And, and the plasma is heating the gas up around the plasma, which makes it go up and rise up the, uh, up the wires there. So I can counteract that by blowing downwards. So it's kind of like, I, I think of it as more like kissing the electricity and encouraging it to do something. So if I just bring that apart a little. So you can play, really play with this stuff. So you can see why I find it so exciting and, and you can work with the, with the way that the plasma is behaved and, and pushing it through tubes and bending the tube and making it go in a very specific direction and sculpturing it so that you've got image from the electricity. So I'm just going to switch that off now because these wires get very hot. So, yeah, one thing, don't try that at home. <laughs> so, I guess we can say that um, being creative with light is kind of fun. So, I, I make the electricity kind of go through these shapes. So, I'll just put that back on again. So what's happening here is the electricity is actually travelling through me and it's buzzing, I can feel it, I can feel it. But there's hardly any current there, it's just a little bit of, of energy. So we've got that glow from just it passing through my body. But as soon as we put the make a circuit up, so it doesn't need to go through me and it can go through the, the light up. I'll beautiful is that. So that's my medium, that's what I enjoy working with electricity. So my work, this kind of medium, this kind of concept, you can see this playing around in here. This is just amazing. See, the, 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 just the interaction, the play, the touch, and the feel of, of, um, of, of the electricity and the, the glass and the way it behaves, it's just phenomenal. So, this is the detail from this piece here that I was telling you about. The, um, you can see it here. But it, it, the, the thing is about a piece of work like this where I'm trying to say something, I'm going a little bit further than getting the detail and painting with electricity. I'm showing, I'm, t I'm displaying my feelings, my emotions about what neon and what plasma is all about and how understood it is. And this, really works with that concept that people don't really understand the concept and, and the fundamentals of, of, of plasmas and how they can be used to create light in a phenomenal, a phenomenal way. It's a beautiful medium to use. So yeah, the, uh, this is the, the snake cobra and um, I'm really pleased with this actually. It, was, it, it came out quite quickly. I was, I was offered the space upstairs and the tables were kind of in the way, but then I thought, well, actually, can we leave them in there? And then I thought, I'm looking into a sculpture. So I put my mind around what was possible with, with a, a boardroom table and the kind of concepts. And, and I was thinking about um, either a Rothschild work down at the Hepworth, which you must go and see because it's absolutely incredible. There's a series of photographs there of snakes around people, and it's just amazing to see these, the forms. And, and I thought I can marry these two together, particularly with it being the Hepworth opening this weekend. So that's why there's this cobra laid across the boardroom table, this snake like, like Aaron Sugar going, you're fired. You know, mm -hmm. so it's got that kind of energy about it. And, um, and almost haunting, really. 
um, and the fangs, it's, it's, it becomes uncomfortable in a way to come, come near, near to it. So you can see here the, the fangs that I fashioned into the glass and, and here as well. It's a tricky thing to do to join tubular glass together. You can only really understand how tricky it is when you actually have a pair when you try and melt the glass and see how it behaves. It's one thing working with molten glass, it's another working with a, a tube of glass. And um, talking about the way things become untouchable, this is this is exactly that. I, I have this like zero, and the book is incarcerated in this enclosure, so it's, so there's lasers around it, or laser-like light around it, so it makes it almost um, unobtainable. The, the book, incidentally, in the middle, um, it was one of the books that I gathered together from uh, when I was collecting books for this piece. But the book itself, um, I got for nothing, and I just couldn't believe it when I looked at it because the the book was um, it's called a book of words for superior people, and the words on it are just amazing. They're just so wonderful, and so it's a joy just to sit and read and look at look at these weird words that you never remember, but you wish you could because you've been to the crack. <laughs> So, yeah, on to um, the vowels, which is a word I've made up because problems with words and things, and then words don't work for a particular description of something, so I like to make something up. So these, these are flowers and vases, so they kind of merge together in one sculpture form. So you've got a, a bottle, which is the vase, and then the flower, which is the glass form coming out of it, taking obvious inspiration from, from flowers. And they became a series of different concepts and ideas about making flowers out of glass and, and bottles. Because I love found, ob the found objects, um, the, the fact that I can take something that's old and previously formed and make it into something new and exciting, like a bottle, which is very sculptory, engineered for it's being forced into a mold and made into a particular shape. So to actually change that and free it up is incredible. This one in the end here, the details not very good on this um, picture there, it's clear actually on the screen, but it's um, the, 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 the neck of the, you have to go upstairs and have a look at it, but the neck has almost been torn open and it looks rather like a, a flower opening and then this incredibly fragile um, sediment, I think it's called, coming out of the, the top of the bottle. It's so fragile, it bounces, um, just under the slightest wind, it just bounces and it's flat. Solid glass. And again, going into the more detail of the, the piece, you can see how worked this is. And it's a real person. And I love the contrast between this you know, 12 millimeter machine drawn glass going into and joined to this incredibly freed up piece of glass that's up there with the green, the blue, and the white. And um, this is about three millimeters in diameter, going down to about half a millimeter in diameter at the end of that. So do go and have a real close look at these detailed glass pieces that are up there. So a couple of people said to me after I was making these, these bottle pieces that could they not light up? And I thought, well, I guess they could actually, yeah, really. So um, neither came from the fact that I needed to, to light them up um, and fill them with this wonderful light. Um, plasma. So inside there you've got plasma. And this is kind of the first real serious work that I've done with um, really high frequency. Um, does everybody, anybody know about Tesla? I mean, the, the first piece that, that you saw was a quote from Tesla. Tesla worked with um, frequencies and the changing velocities of frequencies and resonance. So you know when something vibrates and fluctuates and you get this wave fat pattern form happening. Well, this is what happens when you use high frequencies with electricity. So you, um, the amplitude goes up and down. So if you switch something on and off 20,000 times a second, you can force the electricity to travel to the very proximity ends of these glass pieces and light the whole thing up, um, which is quite incredible. An interesting fact from Tesla actually was when he was doing these experiments with um, frequency, he had a flat upstairs in a tower block in, well not such a tower block, but a few floors up in this, in this building in New York. 
and he um, was making a, a, a vibration with a, with a, with a motor and, and a drum, and he actually met the resonant frequency of the building and caused the building to shake, which threw crockery off the walls in um, downstairs shops. Um, which was, he didn't know he'd done it until he went downstairs and all the shops crockery had been smashed. So that it had found what he was looking for. And, and that's when he decided, can it be done with electricity? It can. It was fantastic. So that's how we managed to do things like this with high frequency. We can make electricity do some really quite strange things. Um, talking about resonance, talking about the Hepworth, it was great on Friday because they had a band and they were playing brass instruments and I made this many, many years ago. This is the end of a bottle of gas. This is the 100% um, neon in there. That's what I used to put inside my tubes. So I've got that in there and this is what's left actually of a neon tube. So, But when you hit a resonance, you blow down here and make a noise. It's just, it's, if there's no amplitude to it. But as soon as you hit the right resonant frequency, just like the electricity, just like the building, it makes it really loud. So you get, it, it makes it louder. And the same thing happens to electricity. So that's why you can put force the, the light into the very extremities of, of the tubes. But this, this piece is about kind of the feeling of, of escapism, I suppose, in, in this glass being able to reach out and get away from being just a bottle and, and needing to be so much more. Which is kind of quite austere, that, um, that image. But I invite people to kind of look down and look up at it and look at it just from a different angle as opposed to just straight on. And even with it not lit, it's, it's quite an endearing thing to, to look at, quite unusual, unique. So, yeah, high frequencies. This has got me really excited for this piece. I'm going to show you a video which lasts about three minutes, so it'll give me my voice a little bit of a break. So, um, I'm going to play that now for you, and then I'm going to explain. Well, in fact, I'll tell you about it now before, so you can understand a little bit more about what it is you're looking at. This tube I've made here, it was it's kind of born out of some research I did many, many years ago um, when I was training and I was told not to faff around because it'll break the bombarding equipment, <laughs> but um, which, which is of course fine, but now I've got my own equipment, I can break it myself, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I made this, and what, what we've got inside here at the present is just the gas, um, but there's also particles in there which are solid, solid particles. And what goes on inside this tube is absolutely amazing. Um, it, was, it stems from reading about um, Voyager going through Saturn rings. And Saturn rings, we've discovered, are actually pretty much 90% plasma and particles within the plasma. So particles that have not been vaporized and are not consumed by the plasma, which is really unique. And so to create a plasma down here that can support solid particles, this hasn't been done. Um, they've been doing this in Yale and they've managed to create some plasmas that carry particles that, can, that float, that are visible, they're large. So they'll only travel very, very slowly. <coughs> and you can Google it and see it on, on YouTube, but there's these particles float in the plasma. But what's exciting about this is that I've managed to throw these particles into hypervelocity. Hyper so they're traveling, they'll be less than because they're actually colliding with the walls of the glass, which is what you'll see in the video. And this one I've gonna light still. But the particles are traveling um, up to around 40,000 kilometers per second. So there's an incredible speed. So you imagine that the actual electrons inside there are traveling at the speed of light from one end to the other. And they are forcing the particles to go into that plasma stream and travel from one end to the other. So the plasma is blue and the particles light up red. So, without further ado, you can listen to a bit of Vivaldi and watch the plasma screen. This is um, actually a choreographed
So, what, you know, this is, for, for me, when I actually made it, it, it moved me. It was just the thought that I've generated a plasma that can support particles in that way was just absolutely amazing. And um, I'm getting all sorts of uh, emails and responses from the YouTube film that I've put on about it. Um, so this is the first time that the actual tube has been lit for people. So you get to see the actual effect in reality here. So the flickering is for real. And it's just, it's just so beautiful the way that the, the plasma is there. You can see the red sparks coming from here, there, the dust particles coming from inside and literally firing through the inside of the tube to the other end and colliding with the, the walls of the glass as it, it shoots through and down to the other end. The actual term, scientific term, which is just amazing for this, is, is dusty plasma. So it really says it all. And so this piece is actually called dusty plasma. And it's completely stable. Whenever I've made a tube like this in the past years ago, it would live for a while and then you'd get what's called cleanup, which is where the um, the particles become vaporized and consumed within the plasma and they either the tube fails or it settles down and essentially turns into a regular neon tube so it's just lit all the time. But with this it, it's not it's not doing that, it hasn't done that and it's been on for many hours now and, and it stayed in this stable form where the particles don't uh, become uh, vaporized and, uh, and consumed by the, the plasma or, or the electrode shells. So yeah, it's, it's quite incredible, it's quite a beautiful thing. And the, the photographs, they're again not particularly good up here, but the, the capture of these, um, the lines of light within the tube, you can see here where the particles bounced through with the high speed shutter. The, it's just it's just amazing. I mean, you can see now where Saturn rings come from. If you was to go up there, the violence is phenomenal. It's just the speed at which things are going on. It looks so tranquil, but it's not. It's incredibly active and vibrant. So, onwards. This was my inspiration for light reading. I had an idea that I struggle with reading so much and I just, you know, I wish I could because I love books. I love to be able to read and information and gather and things. So, and I thought, I'm good at neon making, I'm good at making glass bend and I, can I make that happen to books and force what I'm good at through books? And so born out of that was light reading where I can actually puncture the books with the neon that I've made. And I thought, I'm not just going to do that, I'm going to actually melt the glass and, and bend the glass while it's through the books and put the molten glass through the books, the books burning. So it was as much about the process of creating the piece as it was to actually um, coming up with, with, with the idea and just making it. So it was about making it as opposed to the finished object. So the first thing I had to do was gather some books up. And, and I didn't want just any books. They had the books that nobody wanted, so I went to charity shops and they asked them to give me books, which didn't go down too well. <laughs> but anyway, they, 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 they agreed in the end that there were some books that they just couldn't sell, so they gave me them, which was great. But they had no identity to them, as you can see, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what they are. So I, 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 I was fascinated when I actually got back and opened books to find out what they actually were. And there, there were books, um, there was a couple of dictionaries, which was really strange to say I was doing, it was the words that was my problem, and they were dictionaries. <laughs> and um, a, a book, Star Wars, I loved Star Wars, and a Star Wars book. Um, Shakespeare, there was all sorts of books there that I found fascinating, all to do with, with specific types of reading and things that, that I found interesting. And, um, so consequently, they got they got destroyed and put into this sculpture, which um, which encapsulates the book. So you can't turn the pages. You can't. You can only read what's in front of you. And this is what I have with books. I read the first couple of pages, 
and I forget what I've read, so I have to go back. So you, you find yourself doing this flip back and back and forwards while you're reading a book, and that kind of says it all that it's str you struggle to get through a book. There is one book on there actually that, that's at the back here, um, and, and that's Undestroyed, and that's a book about the monarchy, so I thought I can't ever start to get put in prison somewhere. So you, I've been invited to look at the detail of these. So you've got, although I've, been, I've bent this glass with uh, an intention of freedom and, and just playing with the glass as it went through the books, and I ended up actually making geometric shapes, which I really didn't plan. So we've got this wonderful spiral at the amount of the book there, uh, which is just great. So if you look at the sculpture from different angles, you can see all sorts of things going on. And underneath the burn of the, the actual front of the book is quite interesting as well, with the, with the detail in there. So I'm going to move past this is quarter to three now. So this, this is an inspirational piece that I've been working on. And, and it was full of sand, now it's full of glass. And it's got the lights in it. And whole, ultimately, I really want to achieve a, a big sculpture with this, a geyser. So it's going to be massive. It's going to have some neon kind of just twinkling around the bottom. And then every sort of, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes or so, there's going to be this mush of light going up into the sky um, through a glass glass uh, structure, which um, I'd, I'd really love to do. I've got this, this idea and this vision in my head to, to create this, uh, this, this piece. Um, Wakey, well this was the sculpture that was on the wall in the reception when the exhibition was downstairs. Um, anybody that, that saw that, you know, from being a long line like this. And yes, it is a landscape, but it not, doesn't have to be. What it was was I took things that were important to me about Wakefield here. Because I was putting this in Wakefield in the art house, I thought I'll do something about Wakefield. So things that were important to me. I love points of buildings and spires. So we've got the spires going on here, the Gothic, wonderful Gothic cock clock tower there, and the cathedral, of course, and the council um, down. So it's great to, to be able to put those in, but also things that are important to me, like the house shape here, the art house, and this red dot represents the neon sculpture that's on the roof of neon workshops um, down on George Street, um, that I made for Richard Wheater and, and Victoria Lucas. And, and so things like that, are, they're so important. But more recently, of course, we've got this structure on the end there, which, um, we all went down to our glass of wine. But the, um, of course, who really recognise this? It's been in Hepworth. So uh, the Hepworth got its little place in there because I really thought that it was kind of so important for Wakefield to get this building. I mean, a lot of people find it kind of a little controversial of is it right? And, and all. But I think it can only really be good, ultimately. It's going to bring people here. Um, I'm just going to flick back. There are a word in here. There is, it says Wakey through here. There's a W, a letter A, K, E, and then a Y right at the end there. So it had to have Wakey written in it as well. So my work in general tends to go all over the place. This is a, a splash of different things that I've done and different places that I get inspiration from. So, you know, you name them lights, then this is indicative of Piccadilly Circus, of course. This is the last time that every sign on the Piccadilly Circus was neon. They've all gone now. There is no neon left there at all. So I think it's a kind of fitting memory or memorial almost to have a photograph because they did decide that they wouldn't have any neon left there. And it's real sad because this is an absolutely huge. These are three floors, but so it's kind of four stories high, this. Goodness knows how big it is, but it's for a theatre, it's just for a, it's for a play, you know, in London. And it's just amazing that they used to go to such lengths to decorate a building with decadence and imagery to, to do, to sell things using neon. And this was my play on that, doing St. George's flag, and it's animated, so it's all singing, all dancing. <laughs> it was a temporary installation. So yeah, there were windows there, those for their Christmas. So, and I do commissions, you know, so people ask me to make things. I had 
a great, okay, great opportunity. This was um, obviously at Chaligar, the Iron Bridge Museum. They wanted um, a replica of the Iron Bridge Garden Museum, making in glass and light. So I made the, the neon bridge there. It's actually a flip side. The, the, this post is at the other end there, not this end, not this actually there. So it's, it's kind of back to front. But I, I kind of like this. Because the, the bench it stood on is a bit like the river underneath, which I thought was quite, kind of quite playful, really, between the two. Um, this is the first sculpture I ever sold, and it's a window I broke in, um, just after I finished the art college and glued it back together again meticulously. <laughs> and um, I sold that, so I'm so chuffed. So I'm like, <laughs> But I love it, I still like it. I, I still like the, the concept of a frozen image that's, that you can look around. It's one thing having 3D graphics on a computer, but it's another thing to actually look around a frozen you know, window that's been broken and frozen. So I did a series of that with televisions and other glass objects where I break them and then fuse them back together again and to give that feeling of, of fear and of, oh my, it's broken. And smashed a hammer through a television. So, I think that's that was their 25th um, anniversary in, in um, Paris, and I filmed a huge wall with Adidas neon shoes. And this song was so pleased with. This is blue glass, and it's got neon inside it, so it's, that's where the red's going to be. You can see the blue from the blue glass. But this is called Goddess of Dawn, and it's it's in a hotel now in, in Bergen in Norway. Um, it's still to be installed, they've got it in storage, so they keep asking me to go over and, <laughs> and install it for them. But, uh, you can see this crown shape, and this is where uh, the, the, the northern lights were always called by the Romans, the, the, the goddess of dawn, but they, they, didn't, they, never, they never got out into space. They never got out to look down on Earth and see the fact that the northern lights are a crown that are sat on the top of Earth. So it's really, really fitting to call it the goddess of dawn because of this crown structure. So the sculpture can sit in this crown-like form, or it can have this wave pattern, which is pretty much how we see the northern lights from, from, uh, from Earth. That's it.